Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Richard Clock of Rich Made Knives. I first saw Rich Made Knives at Blade Show 2021, where the audacious and huge designs hooked my eye, and in checking out the knives, they were in hand both familiar and exotic. Clock makes his folders one at a time in Colorado. They are big, sculptural frame locks and motifs and shapes that you'd never imagine seeing on a folder. After my eye got over the shock of Rich Made's unusual designs, I began making unexpected visual connections that have me seeing these as art knives and seeing them in a new light. We'll, eat, we'll meet Richard and talk all about his work, but first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share the show with friends. You can also download it to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you uh, would like to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is scan the QR code on your screen or head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Hi, Richard. Welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Hi, Bob. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. So, uh, as I mentioned up front, your knives are uh, very unusual. Uh, they're they're set in a in a um, framework that we understand, you know, titanium frame locks. Uh, but that's about where it ends. Um, I want to talk all about your current style of knives and uh, and everything about them. But before we get there, I got to find out how you got interested in knives in the first place and started making them. Yeah, so about seven years ago, I attended my first knife show uh, here in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I picked up two or three knives. Uh, some of them, were, I think two used ones and one new one, and um, I really liked them, and I wanted to make some changes. You know, one of the used ones I got, the action wasn't very good, and so I set about disassembling the knife and seeing how it worked, and I was fascinated by the way that the frame line worked and the construction and uh, from there, it just kind of spiraled out of control to the point where I started uh, customize, buying knives, customizing them, reselling them. Uh, for about six months, I, I did customization of other makers' knives or production knives. People would send them in to me, and then I would uh, do some customization to their specifications, and then I would uh, uh, you know, send them back to them. And then after doing that for about six months, I started to realize I'd much rather be making my own and customizing my own. And so I started really slow, kind of not really knowing what to do or how to do it. And um, and just kind of took it from there and, and started off just uh, with test parts, like using aluminum instead of titanium, um, using steel and not worrying about the heat treat till later. And just mm -hmm. uh, all of my original designs were drawn out on paper by hand. I would I would literally cut them out with a pair of scissors and then I would put them on the, 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 the stock, whether it was aluminum or steel or titanium. I would draw it out with a Sharpie and then I would cut it out with my bandsaw and then uh, throw that one away and try again. And, you know, it's just that it took about six months before I could really make uh, a folder that was um, what I consider to be acceptable and ready to, you know, to actually use. So it was it was a, it's been a learning process. It's going on, I think, going on about six years now. Um, so I would say that uh, it was and it was just something that fascinated me. And I slowly I didn't have any, any knife workshop. I didn't have a metal shop. Started off with uh, my first belt grinder and then I bought a, 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 a saw, a metal saw uh, and a band saw. And then just kind of went from there and started off with a really small um, uh, heat treat oven. Uh, and literally, I could only do a knife about you know, yay big because the, the oven was really small and it wouldn't it wouldn't get very hot. So I could only use tool steels and I slowly upgraded and got um, a much better oven. And now it's to the point where I just kept taking over more and more space in my basement to where now it's half. Uh, I've got the entire basement dedicated to my to my workshop now. Well, 
so uh, okay so something interests me here first of all you got a couple of knives at your first knife show and your first instinct was to take them apart and see how they work yes. and then you started making knives and you went straight for the hard stuff you went straight for folders so are you a tinkerer by heart what's your what's your background yeah i'm in it um so i started off in the navy i was in the navy for seven years in in it while i was in the service as well um, that's what I do for a living. Um, I work for one of the big IT companies and uh, I don't make knives for a living. This is just a part-time endeavor for me. I make knives mainly evenings and weekends, usually just weekends. Um, and then, um, you know, I started, I was saying, so I was saying I went from the Navy into the private sector uh, in the IT space. And uh, the just the, um, the, the way that the knife was designed and the engineering behind it is what really kind of drew me in and uh, I went to my first knife show, which was Blade Show in Atlanta, because I have family in Georgia. So um, while I was there visiting my parents, we went out to Blade Show, and I started looking at all the knives. There was just so much to choose from, and I probably bought more than I could carry out the front door that first time I went. And then when I got back, I just started ripping them all apart and seeing how they were made, and 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 just like I I, I got to try to do this myself, and so. Um, that's kind of what started it. It's just a real curiosity to, you know, to challenge myself. And um, on the flip side of that, it was like, this is going to be my side business and my retirement business. You know, I've got probably going to work for another 10 years or so and then retire. And then once I retire from my regular job, then uh, I'll have something to do to keep me busy so that, uh, you know, I just don't sit around and, um, and vegetate all day. So give me something to do in my spare time. Uh, I think it's interesting that uh, you're um, in IT, and uh, I've spoken to a couple of people actually quite recently who are IT professionals and who make these very expressive knives, not just your average run-of-the-mill knives. I'm wondering if there's some sort of connection between uh, the kind of work you do <laughs> and then the kind of work you make. I'm not sure. You know, I, I, I really uh, kind of got drawn to the really ridiculously large overbuilt knives. You know, Medford knives was one of my first. I really liked that big giant Praetorian that he made. That was when I first saw that. I was like, wow, this is so cool. Uh, you know, I like gigantic big watches. Everything just, you know, to me, it's like the bigger, the beefier, the, the crazier it is just kind of appeals to me for some reason. And so I kind of gravitated that way uh, with my knife making. And um you know, another thing is, you know, kind of thinking about the style that I have and the and, and why I went there is, you know, walking around Blade Show, if you ever go there, or one of, even any of the larger knife shows, you walk around, you see just a sea of stuff that's so similar, different colors, some shape variations. But for the most part, you could probably, you know, you could probably find a thousand knives that all look like they could be clones of each other. And I had no interest in that. It's like my one of my first thoughts was I am not going to design or make a knife that sitting on a table, somebody just walks by and doesn't even notice it. You know, it's like I wanted to make something that really made a statement. And that was just I try to come up with the most crazy ideas I possibly can when I design them. And uh, I, I kind of have a no holes barred. As you saw the one you just put up. By the way, I've got some on the table here to show you that I just oh, recently made. I would love to um, see them. Oh, we'll get, yeah, we'll get there. But, um, you know, the 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 whole idea for me was just uh, make what I like, make what's unique to me and interest to me. And if nobody wants to buy it, then I don't nobody wants to buy it. It's it's not supporting me. It's not paying my rent. You know, it's not paying my mortgage. Eh, doesn't really bother me. Um, so I, that's kind of like one of the advantages, I think, of being a part time maker that doesn't live off that income um, is you're not worried about what other people think. You're not worried about whether you sell something or don't sell something. I've been very fortunate and I've that I've sold everything I've made for the last five years. But, you know, if that wasn't the case, I might slow down and make one knife a month, um, make 10 a year and, you know, hopefully find 10 people that were willing to support me in what I do. Uh, the the knife that Jim just had up uh, was from February 2021 is the knife of yours that um, uh, when I saw that it, it, it all clicked with me for some reason that knife uh, in it uh, in itself um, what's it, it's called a zombie killer and I know it's a, it was yes. a crazy build a zombie killer that one in particular something about all of the um, right oh here. man yeah um, Something about the sculptural element of that um, 
just is moving to me, uh, especially uh, it, it just it looks like an abstract expressionist painting or it looks like some piece of graffiti or something. Can't quite put my finger on it, but it, it evokes a lot. Let it, tell us about your design style and, and how you evolved to this to this sort of abstract spot. I almost started with that. That was one of my very first designs. The, this this one here, this original um, zombie killer. This was one of my first knives, and um, I I just gravitated towards just make it a really really big knife, the fattest steel I could find, and um, and then how crazy can I make it? You know, what can I do to this thing that just you know I I, I kind of wanted to make a knife that looks like. You dug it up out of the ground from World War II. It's been driven mm -hmm. over by tanks and stuff like that. Um, because um, to me, it's like you can only do so many colors. You can only do so many styles of finishes. You know, at some point, you just run out of ideas. And so when you're doing kind of what I'm doing, which is making knives on the side, you don't, you're not, you don't really care about how many you sell. You start to think to yourself, I want to focus more on what can I do that just has never i've not something i've never seen before right and you know you you wake up in the morning and that's kind of where we'll talk a little bit about this one I, this is one of those wake you know wake up in the morning or in the shower thinking about yeah. i i gotta i gotta try so that, i wonder if it's possible to put copper across the top of a knife and make it look like a um a bar a barbed wire fence you know Wow. Uh, and that's kind of where this came from when I when I did this. I, I, I like I'm going to drill. I'm going to I'm going to cut out the center of the blade, and I'm going to uh, I'm huh. going to put two holes in the end, and I'm going to I'm going to attach them together using uh, just some wire, you know. And um, and so that's kind of where that came from. Here's a, here's a, here's the same knife just on a smaller size. I've never done this before. This is no one's ever seen this knife. This is the first time it's ever been displayed. Wow. Um, these are these are going to blade show. These this is the this is the two different styles. Oh, let's see where I got them. Yeah. Give you an idea of the style here. So this is the medium zombie killer. This is the large. Um, and both of them, there's these are the only two with the copper across the top. So it's like, you know, one of the interesting things I think about with my knives is when you get one, you're not going to run across someone else that's got one that looks exactly the same. They're all different in some way. Because when I when I start off making the knife, I just kind of let things go. I flow it. I, I look at it and I think, what do I want to do with this knife? How do I want this one to come out? I don't, I don't, you know, have a, a list where I say, okay, these are all going to. I'm going to make ten of these, and they're all going to look the same. I never do that. Each one gets its own little bit unique touch to it. So you were saying before that uh, when you first started, you drew everything out on paper. Does that mean yes. now you approach it uh, um, kind of? like a sculptor approaches a marble and you just start digging into it or um, I so, mean, I've noticed your things are very, very uniquely carved. They seem carved. Yeah. So, um, so after about two, so for, you know, I know I was jumping around a bit. So the first couple of years, that's the way I did it. I, I would draw the knife out, cut it out. And um, I, I literally kept the template of the, the cardboard cutout and every knife was drawn from that cardboard cutout and then cut out on the bandsaw. Well, after doing that for two years, I just realized that this has taken way too much time. And every every single, when you do it that way, every single knife has to be tweaked and tuned and adjusted because there's every single time there's slight difference, differences between them. So I finally realized I got to get, I got to make my life a little easier and I got to figure out how to do, take these designs that I did in cardboard and move them into AutoCAD. So... I started taking AutoCAD training online. I, I, I purchased AutoCAD, installed it on my computer. I spent probably a month just teaching myself how to use AutoCAD. I transferred, I started slowly transferring one design after the next into AutoCAD. And, um, and then I started searching for a water jet cutter. Um, I found someone here locally in Denver that, that did it. And that took about probably six months to a year before, when you first start working with a water jet cutter, especially one that in my case, had never worked with a knife maker before. They have really no idea what they're cutting or why. So it took me a year to kind of train my, my water jet cutting guy to know I need this size nozzle, I need this speed, I need this level of tolerance. And then I finally kind of got him to where to, to, to get me the parts that I need. And so now 
all of my all these designs, the handles and the blade shapes and everything are in AutoCAD. And then I can I can I, I basically uh, buy like sheets of titanium and sheets of steel, bring them to him, and I get maybe you know probably about ten of each models in different sizes. I get them all cut, and then I just have them in my basement, all the parts stacked, so that um, when now when I go to start, I just grab the two slabs, the blade, grind the blade, heat treat the blade, all that I do in my own workshop. All of this, uh, all the cutting. All of the, uh, the you know the drilling, um, the finish work, the, the 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 blade edge, all that I do, all that's done by hand. Um, so the only part of it that um, I have water jet cut is just the holes and the blades and pocket clips and so forth. Just because oh, it saved it, it it made life so much easier at that point when I went when I did that. So I try to keep like ten of every size and every model in stock parts that I could so I could make one of any model I want. And so, you know, I'll go down on a Saturday morning into my workshop and say, oh, what do I feel like making today? Oh, let's make one of these and one of these, you know? So I might, I usually do two or three um, a week, depending on whether I'm even working that week or not. So I'm probably, uh, that that's kind of my transition from what I drew out. Everything started as drawn out, converted it into AutoCAD. And then from there, um, you know, I, I usually do, when I start off with a brand new design, I only get um, one or two prototype parts cut because you never know if you're going to run into problems. So mm -hmm. it's a pretty involved process to bring out a whole new size or model because you got to make sure that the AutoCAD that you designed is going to work properly. So with the complexity of the outer contours of your of the um, handles and the blades, um, did you notice your work getting more complex once you uh, went to AutoCAD and could kind of repeat and water uh, AutoCAD and WaterJet and could sort of repeat some of those more complicated shapes easier? Um, yeah, once you get the design locked in and you can you can repeat it over and over again. Now you're at the point where you, that's something you don't have to worry about because when you're cutting it out by hand, you know you're. I, I mean, I was literally cutting that you've probably seen. Or may have worked with some mic makers that you cut this lock bar out by hand with a with a uh, a rotary tool and it's just it's so much time so much time can be lost too in that and so now I can focus more of my attention on the design uh, and the uniqueness of the knife and less so much on getting to the point where I've got working parts that I can actually make a knife with uh, so um, it's it's just been an incredibly uh, incredible time saver as well as improving consistency and quality overall. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, the um, suspension bridge feature yeah. across the top of the blades. I got, um, I got a how did, one for you. <laughs> okay, cool. How did that How did that uh, idea spring out? Like, does does it have any um, engineering um, function? Function, yeah. Well, um, so where did the idea come from? Um, so oh, that is I cool. have done. I have done, I haven't show. I don't have any to show you because I only made less than 10 of them, but I started out, I think it was maybe a couple of years ago, I made copper wrapped knives where basically what I did is I, uh, let me go this way, is I bolted some copper on here on the, on the face. And then I basically turned, I, I put this thing in a vise and I, I hit, hit it with a hammer to where it wrapped all the way around. And then I screwed it in on the backside. And then I did the same thing to the blades. Let's find one that's got a top on here. We'll take this one. I, I, I wrapped, I, this was before heat treat. I drilled holes in the steel. I, I attached the copper and I wrapped the copper around the top of the blade. I wrapped the, the handles with copper and I called it the uh, steam, um, the uh, steam, uh, steamer. It was a steamer series because to me it was like a steam trunk, right? A steam trunk has those copper wrapped around the corners. And so I made about 10 of those and it was a lot of work and it was really cool. And it was an idea that I had. It's like, I want to, what can I do to kind of add? I mean, I have literally thought of, I'm going to, I'm going to put a screw in here and I'm going to attach a piece of wire and I'm going to go to here and attach a piece. I'm going to, you know, just it's like steampunk style really, really interested, interested me. So I did that a couple of blade shows ago and I sold probably 10 of those and that was really cool. And I enjoyed doing that. Um, I may do a few more at some point down the road, but um, 
that was kind of the idea in my head was I want to, I want to put something on the outside of the knife. That's really cool. And people love copper. Copper is just one of the coolest materials out there. Oh yeah. And so this idea of, of putting something on top of the blade has been in my head for a while. And I've been kind of noodling it. Like, how can I do that? Right. And, um, you know, how can I attach it and what can I put on there? And so I just took one of my knives and I just started, uh, is probably a good example would be this one here. Um, I just, I just started cutting, right. And I left, I thought I'm going to leave a piece on either corner up here, right. Attach something across here and screw it into the sides of the blade. And, um, and that's kind of where this came, where this idea came from. And once I got the first prototype done, then I thought, okay, now I can go into AutoCAD and I can CAD this to where I don't have to do it all by hand. And I can just, um, get, I can get these part, the, these titanium, this is actually titanium here. So that's kind of was my idea. It's like, I just thought it would look really, really cool because I've done so many of these style where I have the, uh, the cutouts in the blade like this and, you know, almost like a, Freddy, Freddy Krueger's kind of a, yeah. just, you know, it, it's like, how crazy can my brain possibly think up things? And this is just where, where does it come from? It just comes from kind of brainstorming. You know, you wake up in the morning, you're just lay there on a Saturday morning and think, what am I going to build this morning? I don't want to build anything that I've built before. I want to build something totally different, some kind of crazy idea. And that's where kind of like stuff like this comes from. The um, when I was looking at it and thinking about whether it has an engineering purpose, I was thinking your knives, you know, which are pretty large, must have some weight. And and uh, I know your prop, that's not your first concern, but I thought maybe that was a also a way to to save on some weight and a, and a really, you know, kind of compelling and cool looking way that fits in with the whole kind of visual motif. Like to me, I see uh, in your work so far either um sort of decay and destruction i mean you know mm -hmm. that sort of beautiful and decay and destruction that you see right in right. your favorite kind of apocalyptic movies or i see this sort of uh like almost flirtily um uh, sort of viney thing the the one again that that knife from february that that jim had uh, up to me reminds me a little bit more of that it's a little more gestural um which i just think is is pretty interesting yeah, yeah this is one this is one where it doesn't have the, it just has a it's 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 kind of got like a um i call it like a godzilla spine on it yeah um you know where it's his back and then the the back here is is all uh cut out as well and then the back spacer just kind of keeps the spine and you know kind of uh, holds it all together and um and again you know i love i love doing these but there's so much work to do because you literally have to cut these on the bandsaw and then you have to soften every single edge here because mm -hmm. nobody wants a knife that when you go to touch it it's gonna it's gonna feel sharp or it's gonna uh, annoy your fingers and so i love doing these types of knives but man they're just so much hand work goes into those because every single cut you have to soften after you cut it because they come out you know that where the steel and the, or the titanium you make that sharp point it's just it, it's not you, know, you can't leave it that way like i mean think about how many points there were when you're done cutting something like that yeah that every single one of these points here has to be softened so that it feels good on your hand and this is the first time i've ever tried uh powder coating i've got a i've got a i'm bringing a batch of blades with me to blade show that have powder black powder coating i've never done this before and um it came out really cool i was amazed i have never had a whole lot of experience with powder coating. Um, my water jet guy does powder coating. Um, mm -hmm. I have since bought my own powder coating equipment. I'm going to start actually doing it in my own workshop. But I'll tell you a funny story. I'm sorry we're jumping around a lot, but I'll just mm -hmm. tell you a quick funny story. So I had a guy, customer of mine, a long time local here in, De in Denver, who has bought a dozen knives from me now. And he said to me, I really want a black knife. And he's been pestering me for like a, over a year and a half. I want a black knife. I want a black knife. Well, I'm like, I don't have any way to do black. I don't have any way to do powder coating. So I finally was like, all right, all right, fine. I'll do I'll do a small batch of, of knives powder coating. For any of you that don't know, the problem is when if you're going to do like, I think I did six, let's say maybe six knives that were powder coated black. The problem is you have to get all this prep work done, all the sawing, all the groove, everything.
everything has to be totally done before you give it to the powder coater. You have to hand the powder coater like 10 scales and, and all the pocket clips and everything, and then wait, you know, it could be two weeks to a month to get all those powder coated and then come back to you. So you invest in 10, not in, 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 in 10 of those scales, I probably had a month's worth of labor invested in just getting to the point where they were ready to go to powder coating. Then when they come back to powder coating, now you got all these parts sitting there. You're like, oh God, now I got to build 10 knives. I can only do about three a week at my at working part time. So, you know, that's another couple of months to build all those knives. And anyway, um, I, got, I got a batch of, uh, of 10 of them now that are going to be uh, going to go oh, to Blade cool. Show. So we'll see how people like them. But uh, this is another one, another model of mine. This was, um, this one's called the Grim Reaper. And this one's got a dark blade, as you can see. All of that, all of this, um, um, all this grinding here is all done by hand. This is black powder coated. Each one of these holes was was uh, obviously I did that on the drill press after powder coating to give it the two tone look. I've got a few that are just all black, no no two tone, uh, and I liked it. I thought I thought this really came out nice, and I got to be able to do this myself because I can't I can't ever go through. 10 at 10 a batch of 10 just was so yeah. much it's like you know as a knife maker one of the things that you get pride in at least when you're doing really if you're an individual knife maker and you're doing really small batches every one you make you have a sense of accomplishment after you finish it well delay accomplishment that feeling of accomplishment for three months because mm -hmm. you make mm -hmm. you get 10 parts prepped you ship them off to the powder get them for them to come back and then you spend another couple of months putting 10 together. And so it's frustrating because you feel like two months have gone by and I haven't built anything. They're all yeah. in various stages of build in, in pieces. And that can get pretty frustrating. When you were holding up, well, first I'll start this by saying, I think that your collector was right uh, in, ba in badgering you because I think, I think the knives look beautiful with the two tones. When you were holding up the larger one with the blade shut, um yeah. uh, with the black and yeah it, to me that looks like a landscape you know it it, it you could because you get a depth you know between the black and the and the silver from the blade it, it right you know it really pumps up the the visuals of this so my question and and maybe a lot of people would have this question and this was remedied when i actually picked up your knives but how do you uh, you know, what about the ergo? So the ergonomics, you know, that are so important to holding a knife. You have these handles with these very unusual contours. How do you account for that? And and how do you explain the ergonomics on these? Well, um, so I don't focus too much on it other than that when, I, when I first design a knife and go through prototype process of getting cart parts cut and seeing if they work, I hold, just hold them and see how does it feel? Can I get my hands on it? Like this is literally a standard. Right. This, yeah. this is called the uh, fat bastard. This I actually call this a fold sword because it's so big. Um, but you know, just just you know, after I get when I'm doing my prototyping, I I get the parts, I build a couple of prototypes, I feel them, I use them, I carry them for a couple of weeks, I go back into AutoCAD. I you know that doesn't feel good. I need to do this. I need to move that. You know, I want a place to put my thumb when I'm when I'm holding it. I want to have the this here to prevent, uh, you know, your hand from slipping onto the blade. And so to me, the way that I do the, the ergos is I'll prototype the design in AutoCAD. I get two or three cut. I build those two or three. Um, I see if there's any functional problems, any uh, ergo problems, any anything that I want to change a little bit. I'll move this a little bit over here, move that over here. And then I do another another cut and I'll only again maybe only do two or three sometimes I've gone four or five iterations of design build tweak design build tweak I usually sell the prototypes because now I've gotten to the point where after five years I can I know it's going to work I know that mm -hmm. the 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 uh, functionality will be there so I'll usually build four two or three prototypes sell them for basically you know the parts cost just to, to, uh, to you know to move those out and people love getting those kind of prototypes because yeah it's one off that you'll never see again and then it's just to, and then when i finally get to design it's like okay and i will say even today i still make minor minor tweaks you know i'll still take a design that i've been building for three years and when i get to go to do another batch of cut 
I might still move something around just a little bit every, I mean, that's, you know, really minor tweaks, but I still do that just about on every time with every batch, there's little minor changes. Like I made quite a few changes recently to the, to the ratchet. And so for those of you that don't know what that is. Oh yeah, this is so that's cool. That's the full folding hatchet there. So this one I've gone, gone through and made quite a few tweaks to over the years. You know, I think a, I think I saw I, I said before in my thing. intro, I said that uh, I first saw your knives at 2021. 20, but I think this knife I saw before yeah. I saw your your other stuff. This, I think, is your I've first tweaked hit, the, right? the blade. I've, t I've tweaked this this little uh, this design here quite a bit. I've tweaked uh, some of the contours here to your point, right? Making it a little bit more friendly to hold. So as the years have gone by, I all I'm in constant tweak mode. Anytime like, oh, I'm going to move this over a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to smooth this line out a little bit. Um, but this one, uh, this one came out really cool. This is so, a large ratchet. And then this is the small. I'm seeing this uh, Saturn pattern, the Saturn. Uh... This is called, this is new. This is called um, Moon Crater Finish. And uh, this is because uh, it's been one of my favorite designs, but I just added a, uh, bla a sandblast cabinet to my workshop about a month ago. And uh, I'm really having a blast with it, figuratively speaking, blasting my parts. So this is, the, now Now I'm sandblasting the scales. Uh, the blade is, this blade is totally sandblasted and then thrown in the tumbler. Um, so I'm having a lot of fun with that. So it's kind of like I go through these cycles, right? Of I'll do the skeleton knife and then I'll do this and like just kind of whatever feels good or feels right. and kind of catches my eye. And so just having a lot of fun with the sandblast cabinet, even try, try doing a two tone, you know, where just the top is blasted and the bottom is, is a uh, silver grind, throw it in the tumbler for a couple of hours. Um, so that's kind of where that came from, but I, I, I've been enjoying the moon crater finish and it's going to be quite a few knives like that at, uh, at blade show. Here's my, one of my small pocket friendly style knives. As you can tell, I don't make a lot of pocket friendly stuff and here's here's one that is actually pocket friendly this is called the stingray oh that's nice and uh this one this one's this one's one of my most popular since i introduced it i don't make a ton of these um <coughs> but uh i'm going to be making more I've got, these this is the knife that people buy out of my pocket <laughs> when i get together with buddy my buddies and stuff like i just did last weekend was hanging out with my friends and I, I, I they said, oh, what are you carrying? Because they know I always have one of my knives and I pulled one of these out and uh, the, the guy bought it right out of my, one of my buddies bought it right out of my pocket nice. because it's small and, you know, it's relatively thin and um, can can be easily pocket carry. But it, yeah, it's got the same kind of, it's got my rich made flavor in there and it, with the moon crater finish in it. So I kind of, to me, it kind of looks like it's got a little bit of like a galaxy effect. And then you've got some, like the uh, impact into the moon surface uh, with uh, meteorites and stuff. It's kind of a, that, that's the thought process I had in my head when I came up with that design. So there's a real uh, strong contrast between um, the, and don't take this the wrong way, but the sort of chaotic nature of say the handle um, sculpturing and maybe chaotic is not active, the sort of active region of the handle and then the active region of the spine. And then you look at the um, at the bevels and everything is so crisp and clean. And, you know, where the, where the business happens, everything is um, seems to be really squared away and on point. What's it like working in those two worlds of of extreme precision, you know, where everything has to be on a straight line because you're selling these to knife guys who are going to look uh, and then you're off on the rest of the knife, just sculpting and doing crazy stuff. Yeah, it's an interesting point that you make because um, for those who have ever uh, had experience with a grinding machine and, and sitting in front of the grinding machine and grinding steel, um, that's probably where the perfectionist in me is. You just sit there with your eye and you kind of look for it. I will say I have a bit of a philosophy that some people don't like, and that's okay. I don't have a problem with that. Um, my philosophy is, you know, I don't try to I'm give you, I'm going to give you an example here. If you look at this uh, this break here between the two grinds, this is a dual grind. You'll notice the size of that there. And then you'll notice on this side that it's a little bit fatter right here. 
uh, this 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 break. And you know, some people might say, well, it's not perfectly symmetrical, right? Or you know, it's a little off here or there. I don't I don't look at it that way. I look at it as if you want absolutely perfectly symmetrical, you want no indication that a human touched your blade, go buy it at Walmart off the shelf. They've been made by a machine. Every one of them is exactly the same. I look at it as that was ground by me in my workshop, sitting in front of my grinder for an hour. Uh, and that's what you got. That's That was the result. And so to me, I look at it and I say, wow, oh, Richard ground that blade. Um, if you want a blade that you look at and say, wow, I cannot see any, this looks like it was done by a machine. Well, what enjoyment do you get out of that view, in my opinion? So I kind of, I don't worry too much about everything being scientifically perfect. I look at it kind of more as, again, what is my eye see? And as I'm grinding, what am I after? You know, in a, in a blade like this, I'm like, okay, I want to do a two, I'm going to do a compound grind. And I do those quite a bit. Um, and then I also, and, and so that's what, that's kind of the thought process that I go through. So, you know, I don't, I have a little bit of a different philosophy than some of the makers, but I also don't charge $3,000 like some of these crazy custom knife makers do. And I guess if you're spending $3,000 on a knife and, and you find a little thing that's not right, you might not be too happy about that, right? Well, your your approach uh, just I keep coming back to uh, art. It's like uh, it's like um, mark making uh, is a big at least when I was in art school that was the big expression. Mark making has a lot to do with um, how someone knows that something is yours, uh, how you make your mark uh, quite literally on the paper. Well, there you're showing uh, that ridge between those two grinds, and they're not exactly perfect. Just like nothing on on anything handmade is exactly perfect, and that's the whole beauty of it. Right, and same thing, you know, with all the grinds, and you know, they're all just random and whatever, whatever looked good to me at the time. And so that's kind of the way that I approach it. It's like each knife has my own thought, design, and and eye in it, and you're getting a knife made by a person, not a machine. It's not CNC made. And if that's what if that's the style of knife you want, there's go to Blade Show. There's a 500 tables of CNC made knives. You got your C's choice. You could probably get one for 75 bucks. Uh, but if you want a knife made by a custom maker that you know spent their blood, blood, sweat, and tears into that knife, and I can tell you how many times of finger cuts you have. Literally, blood, sweat, and tears go into these knives. So many, so many cuts ends of knife makers. It's just never ending. And so that's kind of, and the nice thing is that I have found that people actually do appreciate that because as I said, I have a, a, a have had no shortage of challenges selling them. Uh, so people, it's obvious to me that people do appreciate that they're getting a knife that is made by hand and has some human imperfection built into that knife. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, I stand behind every knife I made. It was funny. I got contacted by a guy last week who, who had one of my knives. He didn't buy it from me. I don't know where he bought it from, probably from, you know, some some friend of his or maybe online in a, in a used knife uh, forum or something. But he contacted me and he said, hey, can I send my knife in for you for uh, a spa treatment? And how much do you charge? He said, um, there's uh, it's it's not opening as smooth as it used to. I said, there's no charge. I said, I will work on any knife I made forever. If I if you bought it from me, it's a little bit different. If you bought it from me and you ever have a problem with it, not only will I service it forever, but if I can't fix it, I'll just make you another knife. I'll take your knife, toss it in the trash and say, hey, I couldn't fix it. What do you want me to make for you? I'll make you something new. Um, but anyway, this guy sent his knife in for service. And when I took it apart, the washer, the the cage bearings inside were crushed like a looked like somebody had stepped on the thing with a by an elephant or something. So I just took everything apart, put all the new parts back in again, got it all tweaked back up and put it back in the mail to him. So, you know, the, the nice thing about dealing with individual makers is that you're going to get that you know, hopefully for most makers, you're going to get that one-on-one -on -one treatment. And, and and I didn't charge them, even though I had to put new parts into it. I even put new standoffs in, uh, titanium standoffs in the back. So um, it's just, you know, it, the, the idea is you want to keep your customers happy. You want to make sure that they're enjoying their knife forever. And if anyone ever buys a knife from me or acquires one and 
and they need help. I put those service requests and those incoming knives ahead of new builds. Existing customers and builds go before new builds. So if someone contacts me and sends me in a knife, my goal is to turn that knife around in a week if I can. Uh, that's one thing that uh, collectors, especially custom collectors, talk about a lot is developing that relationship with makers and um, uh, how much that makes the knife more worth the money, worth the time, and uh, and sometimes the effort and the weight, you know, to to get one of these knives. What what are your collectors like, and and how did how would you say you first got a toehold um, in having collectors, having regular buyers? So the first time I uh, started selling knives, the very first blade show, I didn't have a table. I went with maybe two or three, four knives that I made, and I sat down in the pit at one of the tables, and I put my knives on the table along with some friends of mine, and people just started walking over and saying, oh, wow, what the heck is that? I said, I'm, I'm just starting to make knives, and these are my first three knives. I walked away from that show at like 20 orders wow. for bills um, because people were like, I want one. How can I get one? I said, oh, I'll build you one. Give me your information. I'll contact you. Uh, so that's kind of how it started is that um, just from word of mouth. And then now it's more like I, I have I post every build I make on Instagram and, and Facebook. I have a, you know, a whole bunch of followers there, and then um, I have a couple of dealers that buy that you know, I have a standing arrangement or a standing okay with Knife Center. They tell me we'll buy everything you make. If you if you if you ever don't want to try to sell it yourself, just send it to us. And it's like <laughs> I appreciate that, but you know, I want to try to get knives out to people for people to handle and so forth. So um, it really has not been an issue with trying to find customers. Usually, they find me. And um, just in the past, uh, about six months ago, I stopped accepting orders um, from customers or from anybody. And the reason I did that is because, yeah, I'm a, I'm a watch collector. You'll see some watches on your feet <laughs> there. Um, the reason I did that, stopped accepting orders, is because uh, I, you know, this is, again, for me, this is a part-time love of what I do. And I just, it's instinctive in me that I wake up on Saturday morning and if I have orders, it just kind of bugs you, right? You're like, I owe, I owe 10 customers knives. I don't, I, I've never accepted a deposit. I will not take a penny from anybody. I used to have this really cool policy where I said, if somebody wants to order a knife, tell me what you want. I will make it for you. If you, if when I'm done building it, if you don't like it, you don't have to buy it. I'll sell it to somebody else. There's no problem there. Uh, and so that took some of the pressure off because I found that in my first, when I first started doing this, if you have people's deposit, they feel like that entitles them to pester you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now they're like, Hey, you got my, you got my 200, 300, $400. Where's my knife? A month goes by checking in. Where's my knife? And so I was like, you know what? I don't want anybody's money. I don't need anybody's money. I'm just going to make you a knife. And then when I'm done, I'll show you what it's like. And if you like it, you can buy it. And if you don't, we part as friends. Uh, you're, you're under no obligation. So I did that for about three years. And then I would only accept orders for about six months out of the year because there were other six months I was building knives for shows, Blade Show and the USN Gathering in Vegas. This past year, I've decided no more orders. That way I don't have to feel like I've got people waiting for me to work. You know, because you wake up in the, on a, a weekend and you're like, I can't go hang out with my family because I got 10 customers waiting for knives. This is kind of this, this, this little voice in the back of your head that says, you got, you got people waiting on you. You got people waiting on yeah. you. Go get to work, go get to work. Well, now that I have no, my books are cleared. I have nobody waiting for any orders. I can wake up on Saturday and say, I'm taking the day off. And I don't feel guilty because there's nobody waiting for a knife. Um, of course, a, a, a spa treatment or repair would take precedence, but those are fairly rare for me. So that's now now I'm actually enjoying myself even more because there's no pressure. If I make one knife for Blade Show, five knives, 10 knives, 20, who cares, right? It's, it is what it is. Um, and so, so that that's my new approach. Who so who are the collectors? What who are the other makers? Do you think that they are collecting? 
Um, you mean who 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 likes me? That probably well, likes other makers. I, I guess what I mean is, um, I in all of the knife people I've spoken with, a lot of people I, I like everything. I'm equal opportunity. Um, I really do love everything. But some people are just folder collectors. Some people just like World War II stuff. Some people just like yeah. fixed blades. Uh, who who goes in for rich made knives? Um, you know, it seems to be people who do kind of tend towards the larger style folders, like the Medford style, the Todd Heater mm -hmm. style, um, those really big, uh, beefy folders. Um, you know, there are people that really enjoy the dress style, you know, the fancy that, and I've done a lot of Timascus as well, but those types of people um, are generally not type of customer. Um, it's someone who, they, they're probably half of my customers are collectors who are looking for, like I call this as an example, I call this a, ta a coffee table knife. This goes on your man cave. Nobody's going to carry this around in their pocket. This is yes. going in your collection so that when you go to hang out with your buddies and you open up your Pelican case full of your collection, you, you pull this, you, you, this thing sitting in there and your buddy says, what the heck is that thing? And he, he, you pull it out and go check this out. And they're like, oh my God, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. Where did you get that from? And then next thing you know, I got another order coming in. Someone else, well, I don't accept orders, but you know what I mean? People are yeah. reaching out to me and saying, how can I get one of those? So I think that um, the, the, the style that I'm after is mainly collectors. You know, I've, I'm starting to get into some people who do carry, which is why I have some of the more pocket-friendly stuff now uh, available. But um, I think it's a people who appreciate the uniqueness of the knife. They're not, they're not fixed blades because they don't make fixed blades. Um, I've made probably less than 10 in the last six years. Uh, and even those were only because I was just goofing off and dabbling and try something I hadn't tried before. Uh, and I don't really get too much into the super, super dressy, fancy style knife because it's just not my thing. I've, I've made probably 20 or 30 full polish time ascus, you know, some polished blades and things, but, um, it's and, and I probably will make some more in the future. It's just not something that calls to me all that much because there's a lot of other people that do it better than I do and and, and appreciate spending so much time every little detail and then the charge of two thousand or three thousand dollars for that knife. It's not me. I'm not not interested in that. I I, I don't want to spend a month making one knife for three grand. I'd rather spend a month making three knives or ten knives and you know, sell them for $500, $600 a piece rather than the other way around. To me, that's just more fulfilling. Uh, yeah. So when you said that uh, that knife in particular was one that you keep in your man cave that you show off to your friends, uh, you know, when they're over for a beer, I, I love that description because I have some knives like that and I've gotten knives probably for that reason, you know, just because or, or just because I myself just love to hold it open it look at it think about it you know uh, certain things you know knives in particular capture our imagination in a way that other tools just do not um i always talk right. about wrenches you don't you don't see too many wrench enthusiasts maybe there are some and, but it's a smaller community than the knife community so there's something in it already as a tool um that's just you know part of us as humans because it goes way back but then you take it and you turn it into a usable art piece, uh, an, ex, uh, an expression. I mean, these to me are all personal expressions of yours, like paintings on a wall. Right. Um, right. You know, become something else. Yeah. And I think that, you know, it's nice that there's room for everybody. There's room for people who want a certain style. There's room for me making weird, crazy stuff that, you know, there's not very many of. You know, I, I probably, this this folding sword, I, if I make five a year, that's a lot for me uh, because there's not that, you know, I mean, how many people want a knife that's this big? So right. at five a year, over five years, there's maybe 25 of them out there in the world. Um, and so, you know, the advantage to that is that there's space for that amount. There's space for the number of people that would have an interest in that. And, um, you know, there's enough room in the collectors uh, for me to, you know, maybe make 50, 60 knives a year and, uh, and people seem to appreciate them. And it's 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 nice that people like some of the crazy ideas I come up with enough to support me and to buy those knives because, you know, I would stop making them if I had a shelf full of them, 20 of them and nobody wanted them. It's like, well, I guess that 
I'm guess I'm done, right? <laughs> so what do you want to? What do you want to? Tr- what do you want to try? I'm sorry, I just interrupted you there. What do you want to try? What is okay. your? Where Where do you see your style developing to? Um, I'm just going to continue to come up with crazy ideas. This is the newest one, right? There's been probably less than five mm-hmm. suspension blades out in the wild right now. There's going to be probably about I don't know, maybe six or seven of them go on a blade show, right? And there'll probably be 10 or 12 in total. And that'll be the, you know, that'll be the run. And then I'll go on to come up with some other crazy ideas. I've got, I've got other ideas. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to come up with some really wacky, even, you know, if you think some of this is crazy, there's, there's more crazy coming. And, um, you know, my, my take on it is, is there, there are haters in social media, you know, it's a tough world out there. We all know (laughs) that from watching the news. And I've had my share of that. And uh, my attitude is, if you piss people off because you make stuff that's so insane that they get really angry, that means you've you've evoked an visceral response in them and you're doing something right. Because if you make a knife that looks like something that's you could buy at Walmart, then you what did you accomplish? You've accomplished mediocrity, right? make a myth that when you show it to somebody they say that's horrible what the hell would i ever buy that for then you've accomplished i actually triggered something in their brain it might be a negative initial response but it if i held up a knife you know uh, uh, a uh, you know something uh, from one of the major cnc manufacturers you'd be a get you know that's nice it's a knife cool Take it out at a, at a get, get, go hang out with your buddies and take out a knife that you bought from Walmart and show it to them. And they'll be like, yeah, cool. Nice. Take a knife out like this <laughs> and put it down on the table and they'll go, what the heck is that thing? Where did you, what the hell are you going to cut with that thing? You're going to go chopping down little trees out in your backyard. You're going to get a visceral response from people one way or the other. And I enjoy that, right? I kind of enjoy sitting down and thinking, how crazy can, what else can I come up with? Uh, I want to try to come up with, I want to get rid of the, I want to move away from the frame lock. I'd love to come up with another. I, I've, I've been toying with all kinds of ideas on other ways to do lockup um, because this has been done, the, the frame lock's been done to death. And so I've got all these ideas churning in my head. Problem is I have a full-time job and uh, I do IT for a living. And so I don't have a ton of time to devote to it. But as, you know, as my the um, building process evolves. These knives will, um, you know, evolve and new knives will come out. And one advantage is that, you know, if you bought a folding sword or you have one, you know, you might have one of 50 that exist on the face of the planet. And then that'll be the end of that because I'll start going on to something else. Um, and so I think people, some people can appreciate that as opposed to buying a knife that, you know, you're, you're, you're at the February run where they made 6,000 that month. Yeah. Well, it's that idea of uh, soul uh, being sort of injected into the thing that you're working on. And uh, you spend all you put all of your attention on one knife uh, while you're making it or while you're working on it. And that, you know, that absorbs your soul, kind of like some of the stuff on the wall back here that's handmade and, you know, used it. And uh, um, just just the act of hand making it. And spending that time, um, you know, gives it gives it that that soul. And then you look at at the fact that each one is an individual, and uh, that makes it even more so. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's kind of a, a side passion of mine. It's it's scary that I wake up on the weekends thinking about knives and designs and what the heck do I want to make today? Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's just th- just kind of the way you know your brain starts. My brain just starts churning. What what's the next knife? What am I going to design? What am I going to come up with? It's got to be something different. I got to try something I haven't tried before, and I'm kind of always in that mode. You know, it's like it's, there's got to be something else out there, and so I'm constantly pushing myself to come up with crazier, crazier stuff and stuff that just catches my attention and catches my eye. Every once in a while, I come up with an idea, and then I see someone else caught beat me to it. <laughs> Yeah. which you know, that's okay too. I don't mind. So we've talked about blade show a bit. You're going to be there this June. Yeah. Um, tell you'll be there the whole week at a table. I mean, uh, yeah, the whole blade weekend. show is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah. I think my table is 21 C it's the same, been the same table every year. 
Um, and uh, I'm right. I just, I, as of today, I've got uh, 20 built so far. Nice. Uh, and um, I'll probably, I, I'm probably going to get to about 30. I probably, we got about five, six weeks left to go. Um, averaging about three a week. So, you know, with time to get packed up and everything, I'm figuring I got enough time to maybe make about 10 more. Um, I got two in the hopper that are partially, partially through the build process. So I think I'll get somewhere between 25 and 30. Uh, that'll be available for the show. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we'll see uh, how, 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 how long those last. Uh, I, uh, other thing is I do allow remote purchases. You don't have to come to blade show. I try to post a video from my table on my Instagram and my, uh, in my YouTube. And if somebody wanted to, if they saw something that on the video, they're like, Ooh, I like that knife. They can just message me through, uh, either Instagram or Facebook messenger and say, I want to buy that. And then we just arrange through PayPal or whatever. And I take the knife off the table and I put it in the case and I ship it to them after the show is over. So it's kind of nice because people always say to me, how do I get one? When, when, how come, how come there's nothing on your website for sale? It's like, well, I get that. Be patient. Be on the lookout for my for my video from Blade Show and see if you like off the table. Just hit me up. Uh, people can even call mobile if they want it or text me, and then uh, they can just buy it right there from the show. The advantage of going to the show and the reason I go is it gives the people who do go the opportunity to hold them and try them and see them. And it's not something that's really the only opportunity you have to do it before you buy it. Yeah, and and no doubt they're not everyone's cup of tea, but everyone will love to pick them up and check them out. I mean, that's a that's another thing about Blade Show. I mean, people talk about how right. you go there for the for the people, and yes, that is true. But you also go to pick up all of that, all of those different knives. I wouldn't even consider buying, but that you're still interested in because you're a knife junkie or you're a, a serious enthusiast and to all. You know, I find myself picking up kitchen knives. I know I'm never going to buy, you know, a thousand dollar kitchen knife, but still to hold it is amazing. Um, and that's that's a benefit to going to Blade Show. Uh, as as we wrap, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start making knives themselves? Start small, um, sit down with a pad of paper, draw out your knife. Take first thing to do as far as figuring out the geometry and the and the functionality is buy 10 knives and disassemble them all and reassemble them and analyze how they're made and um, and see kind of what works and what doesn't. And then start off making your knives out of cardboard. Just cut it out, you know, with a pair of, draw it, cut it out with a pair of scissors, uh, punch a hole through the middle, go to, go to your local hardware store, buy a screw and put the screw through the pivot and see if it opens and closes and kind of fit everything, kind of see if it fits right. And then if you really want to get into it, just start buying, you know, you can go to Harbor Freight and buy one of their cheap uh, band saws and uh, uh, yeah, one of their small um, belt sanders. And you could just, you know, go buy yourself a piece of steel. Uh, you can order it off of Amazon, start up, maybe start off with aluminum as your side. So it's not as expensive. Don't worry about the frame life part for now. Just kind of work out all the geometry and then just start small from there. And if, if, if that's, if after doing that, you're like, you start building that passion to you. This is something I really want to try to do. Then you could start buying and investing in uh, the equipment, you know, because outfitting a workshop in order to be able to make a knife like this is, is it can get very expensive. And so, you know, some people like to start small. And I talk to so many people that come by my table at Blade Show and they'll, they'll hand me a knife that they made and say, check this out. I just made this. And I bought it. I, I made it all off of Harbor Freight Parts. Or, or, uh, um, machines. And it's like, wow, that's really cool. That, that's great. And they're like, yeah, I'm getting ready to buy my first two by 72 belt, belt sander. It's like, oh, good for you. And so you got to start somewhere, start small and then, uh, you know, see if it's something that you're passionate about because it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of time and energy and, and, and it's a learning process. I'm still learning uh, every, every knife I make, I, I learn a little more, right? I just, I just changed the wheel that I use to grind my lock face to try to make it a little bit smoother. And it seems to work a little bit better now. And so it's like just a constant process. I'm looking for, you know, I just bought a, uh, I told you I just bought a sandblast cabinet. I just bought a giant compressor. I'm looking for a, a surface grinder. So it's like, it's, it's just every year, all the money from the knives goes right back into the workshop, <laughs> new parts, new equipment. And uh, just, it just, you just kept rolling into it. If you're doing this to try to support yourself, good luck with that. That's really hard to do because 
it's going to be, you know, if it takes you a year or two to get good at making knives for that year or two, you're not really making any income. Right. So, you know, it's, it, it's a process to get to the point where in most knife makers who are doing it for a living have gone through, they had a day job, but their end goal was to do it full time. Um, and, and it takes many years of practice to get to that point, but you got to start somewhere, you know, start it out as a hobby. You could even do what I did, which is buy 10 knives, uh, you know, go to the, go to blade show, buy 10 different knives, take them home and just start customizing them. Um, start tweaking them, feel, feel how you could do regrinds on blades. I did that too. Take, take a, take your belt sander instead of starting with a blank piece of steel. Um, start with a regrind on a $50 knife and see how it works. Um, so all kinds of different ways. You just got to get a lot of practice under your belt before you get full. Well, Richard Clock of Rich Made Knives, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a real pleasure uh, getting to know you a little bit and finding out about your process. I think it and your knives are just incredibly interesting and exciting. So thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkie's merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Richard Clock of Rich Made Knives. Uh, be sure to check out Rich Made Knives on Instagram and uh, be prepared to be blown away. Uh, the knives are so cool, so interesting, and uh, like I keep saying, so artistically expressive, in my opinion. Um, so there you go. Join us again next Sunday for another great uh, conversation with another knife person. And uh be sure to join us on Thursday night for Thursday Night Knives right after you watch the Wednesday midweek supplemental right here on the Knife Junkie podcast. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.